notes there through the feed. Um, some pretty good action here. So let me take it from where it is right now backwards. And um, then if you have any questions for me, I can help you out any way that I possibly can, I will. Um, so right now, that's a fib support, a decent one. The thicker, the better. The red horizontal, the blue horizontal is a fib support. You can see how it bounced in between the fib support. Here's an interesting tell. So when you know that there's a support here and it's lost the support and you see how the bulls took it before it gets blue support here, same here. You see how these tails, they start buying it up. Only the one out of three hit. That's a action. Now it's just a small tell. It's not like, but when you, you know, I've talked to a number of people over the last few days. Epic's charting this grid. If you look at it statically, like after trade, like you would a conventional chart, it's not the same. I mean, uh, it holds up uh, as a static chart, but as a live organic uh, breathing is where it really shines. Because you get to see the dynamics, like these 30 minute candles, there's a lot that happens inside of these 30 minute candles. Um, this yellow line is a heavy previous uh, time cycle resistance. And you'd have to look at the epic reports to see why. This purple line is previous resistance, just light in comparison. This circle here was just me marking where yesterday down here, yesterday's video, that would have been done around noonish in here. I had said if the bulls take it up over this resistance, that the machines will target this apex. Now really what I should have said was this, well, no, that's not true. Yeah, this apex here. I mean, they'll target is what they'll do, but this is really the, the quadrant that you're in. This is the test line. So that makes sense that they would take it here first, test it, comes back, hits support, the yellow line, and then comes up to, to chase this. And then earlier today, so, you know, that played out exactly. So once you get to know how the machines relate to the chart, it makes it a lot easier. Now, of course, I should have taken a trade in here, there, and there, but uh, we can deal with that in a minute. Uh, and it's not a shoulda, woulda, coulda thing. It's you've got to look at it backwards and say to yourself, why didn't I, right? Uh, now, my world, and I'm not the only busy person in the world, I understand that, but my world's pretty unusually hectic lately, and to take every trade's tough. Um, this white arrow here, this was from earlier today in the room. Uh, Bernard had asked the question about support and resistance, specifically resistance. Now, <clears throat> I just couldn't get on mic at the time, but you do have to remember this isn't an up channel now. Like that up channel was confirmed. And for anybody watching this video after the fact uh, that doesn't understand what this is, this is charting provided in advance. So this is GPS charting. This is not like conventional charting. And conventional charting is chart as trade goes and as channels build out, you know, you can kind of predict the future. This is this channel was never here. We had it there. The Epic's charting, it was here. Our members knew it was here. But that channel was never there in conventional charting. It was there before trade got anywhere near it. So when I'm speaking about how it trades in the grid, um, it's important to relate how it trades to the fact that this is done in advance. So we could chart this for you 10 years in advance or 16 years or three months. And that's the most important part. The more you trade it, the more you realize that to be the important part because 
when you know how it trades, not just that you've got the grid. So that's what I would call the eighth indicator, actually how it trades, right? So we've gone through the first seven different ways of indicators. The eighth I would call actually the nature of trade inside of it because there's all kinds of inflections. It doesn't look like it. It just looks like a bunch of lines. But how here, yesterday, down at here, could I tell you a trade was going to get here? Because I know the nature of the grid. I know the nature of the machines. I know how they're programmed. They're programmed to take it to the apex as long as the humans follow through. If the humans drop the ball, they'll, they'll take it to you know the lower support more efficient than anything. But if the, if you know if the bulls are in it with the machines, the machines will take it right there, and it, it'll they'll take it there very efficiently. Trades here. What's the shortest distance between here and here? Pretty much perfect. What's the shortest distance between here, this apex, and this apex? Well, it's not. It, it's to do what it did, where it, where it had to test support and then go. But that's the second most efficient way. The most efficient way would be to just scale along this ceiling here because every line is support and resistance on here and this is a quadrant wall and you'll see where it'll just scale along it. Why didn't it? Because the humans backed off. The machines will take it to the support and say, okay, humans, are you going to go up or down? Humans say, I'm going up and it takes it. One comment from a person I talked to yesterday said, well, you know, a friend of mine looked at it and said, well, if you draw enough lines on a chart, you know, you're going to see, you're going to see support and resistance happen. So my response to something like that is <clears throat> take the number of lines that are on this chart, dig out a 30 minute chart, chart it for the next three months and see how it trades in between it and put a bunch of targets in there like we do and tell me how you do. I mean, the obvious answer is it'd be an absolute failure unless you figured out the model. So I'm saying all that because when you get into the next indicator, which is how it actually, and the nature of how it trades, then you'll, you won't lose. So when you look at my trades and I'm running 97, I can't remember, 97.6% win rate when I lose, it's small. How does somebody get 97.6%? And I mean, I'm public about everything I do, right? Very transparent. So how, how do you do that? Now, just understanding the actual grid itself, you might be able to hit 80%, but to get from 80 to near 100% trade uh, probability, you have to understand the nature of the chart. So um, you guys are starting to get it. Now, I'll tell you, right here, taking that short earlier, um, was actually kind of risky. I mean, you did have, you had resistance here. Sure you did. So it's one indicator, and it was, pretty serious resistance, at least on the intraday. So that's the important part. On the intraday, that's serious resistance. And you're right about waiting for that second test at re resistance. But you see how it got through that resistance a few times and it came back? <clears throat> that's, that's the machines taking it through and waiting for the humans to go, or vice versa. Like it's, it's, a, it's hard to explain, but it's like a cooperative effort, right? So it's programmed to go with the flow, right? To go with the crowd and just take it to the next supporter resistance efficiently. So, and you'll never out trade the machines, it's impossible. But you can get near 100% trade success <clears throat> by understanding the nature. So, <clears throat> what this is, is this is resistance on a quadrant. This is not conventional charting. Conventional charters had no idea that's there. We're going up channel, right? That's in conventional charting. That line would make no sense at all in, 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 in zero in any of the 53 indicators that we use. And for anybody that's watching this video that doesn't understand this model, this is 53 indicators. 60 months back on 10 different time cycles calculated 30, 30 just over 30,000 times I think it's 30,236 times 
to get this grid. There is no conventional charting that has that as a resistance line. Out of the 53 that I, I know, this is this is math. So that's a quadrant. Now, here's why it was a little bit risky. Because you're actually in an up channel. So your your whole bias has to be to the up channel. Now, in the up channel, your best probability of success is off of the support of the channel taking the long. Your resistance level, so your upper channel wall is here, your test channel wall is here, line, your mid channel is here. Now maybe you might have been taking it on this mid channel, support and resistance, or on the quadrant resistance. They kind of, well, they, they create an apex. And that's why it's kind of dangerous, because at the apexes is where you get the volatility. But anyway, my point, and the reason why you get the volatility is you get the widest trading range because of these quadrants, right? The machines trade inside quadrants, so the machines are programmed to trade aggressively when you get into the widest width, because from here to here is your widest width. You don't get much width in here, so typically be aggressive unless it gets into a quadrant. You know, it bumps over into a quadrant. Like in here, you don't have a lot of width if you're trading in there, but you bump into this quadrant, now all of a sudden you got tons of width. So that's why you get volatility when it comes through the quadrant walls, right? So if you're trading in here and there's not a lot of volatility, boom, as soon as it comes through here, and that's why it's interesting to watch this live, as soon as it comes through the quadrant wall, boom, it goes to that next resistance you know, and lightning speed because the machines just take it there. So all these things I'm telling you are the nature of the way it trades. So logic says you're going in an up channel. This is your midline for the channel. So if you picture a runway, this is the outside of your runway. And the outside of your runway up here, this is your midline. Your bias is to the bullish side. So whenever you're trading, you know, short, when you're in an up channel, your probabilities are lower than if you're trading long off your supports. So there was no reason for me to miss this trade in here. Right here, <clears throat> so that's an, that's an example of a support, right? Because that's a FIB support long and an uptrend, right? Highest probability, one of the, well, one of the higher, pro it's higher probability going long than it is going short in an uptrend. So I'll put white arrow, um, for you know notes right because green arrows are my entries red arrows are my exits my, my closing positions so i should have entered green here long and i should have closed green here at this yellow line or at very least trailed to here and then trailed to see if it was going to get through that apex you got to be careful cutting here at these apexes because if it gets through that apex that thing can pop right through that resistance you'll see the way these apexes trade so then you know so I should have exited there in an algorithmic trading it's important to go through the shoulda coulda wouldas not to cry in your beer but now I noticed that there was some support have down in here, and I suspect there's, you know, there's some. If I look to the left, um, we'd find some previous time cycle support in there, or maybe a fib on the intra. But um, anyway, we we try not to put, we try to just put the important ones on the chart because it gets really busy. People already say, well, these charts, are, you know, so many lines on there. Well, every single line is important. But you know that's okay. You keep you keep trading it, whatever. Obviously, if you were winning like you can with an algorithm model, you wouldn't even be messaging me. I mean that's the truth, right? Um, so this is resistance here. This is resistance here. But your probability of success on the short is not as great as if you're taking from your support. That's that's a huge probability of success. Huge probability of success. Here's 
you know, big, here's big, um, but you do have that resistance. So now, you know, you got to look at it from a perspective of the quadrant you're in. So you're in, that's the top, that's the bottom. So now you're going through, you know, um, you know, your widest range is right here, right? And then each one of these quadrants, there's four quadrants built into each. So that's the nature of the trade. Now, it'll really mess with your mind if you realize that actually on the 15, 5, 3, and 1, there's these quadrants too. Um, you know, <laughs> um, on the hourly, 2, 4, and daily. But this is the one that the majority of the machines um, are weighed toward, right, the 30-minute. And you can see on the 30-minute candles how. Um, I mean, it's, it's so obvious, right? So what else do I need to tell you? I need to tell you that um, you've got a time cycle. So if trade is right here, the right side end of that quadrant is right here as far as the test lines are concerned. And this, you know, this was a test line area. This is actually the quadrant here. But you can see how it reacted, right? It got up in here, came off, had to test through, got up to, you know, resistance up here, got right up to the quadrant uh, apex and then came off hard. So you've got an important decision here is what I'm trying to get at and you always want to pay attention to these. It's like today I told you <coughs> um, sorry, that around 12.30 you'd see volatility and sure enough, or I said before 12.30, right, because your time cycle, it'll happen sometime before depletion of the time cycle. That's a completion of a time cycle at, at the at the apex, not just at this side, at all four sides. It's a completion. And for different reasons with the machines. Here it's a completion here because the machines get wide width. So it's going to be traded more aggressive. Anyway, you've got one here that's really important. So 5.30 in the morning, tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock, 6.30. Yeah, 6.30. And give yourself an hour on the other side because you'll find that when this trading gets updated, there'll be variance. <clears throat> but that's the test area. This is really, this is really the end of it there. So that's Sunday night. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back and trade a little bit. So right now, what would you do? Um, you're almost always going to take the support long. Now, as you get closer in here, the problem is, see, your trade width gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's why when you trade through the model, <clears throat> when you're into the apex um, or inverse apex, that's where you want to take your big trades because that, you're going to get the biggest width, like here on your short, perfect timing, guys, by the way, because you're getting the most width. Now, it might have stopped here and traded down in here. But your biggest width opportunity, at least on the intraday, is rated that apex always. So let's take a look. Uh, so you just have to be aware as you get closer to the end of this time cycle, the size of your you know, trades can get smaller and smaller. Now it can expand to the outside of the quadrant. But it does get smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's why I'm going to show you something pretty cool here. If you look at the quadrant, right? So that's first base, second base, third base. I always try and put it in that term because it's easy to picture. Now look at this. If we go back in the time cycle a little bit here through the quadrant. Come on. One of our members, by the way, uh, I think he's got a solution for my charting problems. I'm going to try it out. Okay. Now look at this. So the lower inverse apex, right, of this broad quadrant. Look at how oil trades into it. Comes up into here, comes down, comes up into here. Now look at there's the inverse apex. You're telling me these lines are by fluke? Or these lines, how it trades in between here or in between here? 
All these lines are fluke. Mm, come on. Even statically, you can tell. When you watch that live. Anyway, it's not my point. But you can see how it's going around that inverse apex. Once it get in there, look at the volatility. Now that volatility, where did I trade? I traded in that volatility. No. I just cut instead of trailing. This is where I should have re-entered. Sure, I missed, I would have missed the meat here. I missed a lot of meat because I didn't re-enter. But this is the, you know, this is the resistance zone. Why not keep yourself safe and then re-enter? But you can see that you go through the charting, go back in the history, and you'll see it time and time again where the most volatility is in, in the, um, the apex or inverse apex, any of the quadrant uh, time cycle ends. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the EIA report too. That's another reason for the volatility. But you can look back and you'll see it over and over again. Um, two green arrows just means two two tenths. That was one tenth. You know, for a total of five tenths. For me, it was a big trade. I exited there. Should have re-entered there. Should have exited up there. And now you could re-enter like this. Got another, you know, you're getting smaller range all the way through. But if it pops up and it takes off, man, you got, you know, into the next quad, you got a whole new quad to deal with there. Um, and if it's bullish, you know, don't worry about those um, those fib support resistance lines. Um, it'll just slice right through them. It's the quad walls. It's the quadrants. Um, and then prior, so anybody watching this video that doesn't know, this is an important support or resistance uh, for the actual wide range algorithmic trading area. Uh, and that's one of the best parts of this charting is that we know as soon as it gets up in here, okay, now it's in a new area and we've got all kinds of range to the upside. And we already know where our channels are. I mean, it's a sweet way to trade oil. Uh, I don't you know, I don't hit 97% because I'm gifted. I hit 97% because I have gifted uh, intelligence. And it's not my gifted intelligence, it's it's the charts. This here, keep in mind, there's always a second line uh, that goes to the right, uh, and it's got a divergence. And I put it in here just to show members that that's always there. Um, so you gotta give it a little bit of width. Um, and as time goes on, we'll get more and more specific about it. And hopefully that gets coded out of it completely when the coding happens here. Um, the purple lines are just showing this is the bottom of the upper channel decision. It's like a GPS telling our members, okay, it's either going to go up channel or it's going to go down channel. And down channel, this is the, the top wall. This is the mid line for the down channel. So if you picture the runway again, this is the top of the runway the mid channel and then the lower is down in here. In the up channel, this was the up channel bottom, the test line, the mid, and the runway. And to imagine that this was drawn in advance of trade getting there tells you even more so what you're really dealing with here. Because our members knew that when it was down here, and it's funny, right? Because I get all the social media messages and stuff and people tell me, oh, I caught the bottom exactly. Okay. Conventional charting, like I know, I know some of the best traders I can guarantee to you in the world. They're fantastic traders. Like once you get to the caliber of these guys, they are fantastic. Very few people can catch a, a knife, very few. But when you know that that channel wall's there in advance, you got a much better opportunity. So I'm just gonna take it really quick, because here, you see that arrow? That tells our member, there's the channel going up, that arrow there, there's the channel going down. Uh, this is the bottom of the channel going up, bottom of the channel going down, midline of the channel going down, right? So. Our members knew where all this was, so that you know it tanked down into here, and it gets up into here, and it retests on a second test of support, bounces up, and I hit it. 
So that's what I mean by the second test. And that goes for resistance like Bernard was doing there earlier today and support. I always do. You don't have to. I wait for the second. You could hit the first and would have got more range. There's always a way with my trading style to get 10 to 15, even 20% more in the trade than I get. In fact, a lot of times even more than that. Like I only get 40% of the trade, even when I'm trading for the full time, which I'm not right now. Um, anyway, so I hit her. Now these, these are intraday quadrants. Um, and this is where you have to watch it live because it's really hard to see it in a static environment. But you can still see where, you know, oil gets up in here, resistance, you know, it's in the, it's as far as the smaller uh, intraday quadrant, it's in the apex area, right? So you're getting most width right there. It fails support, comes back down, tests, you know, and you can follow it through and see, you know, so here's the upper and it's bouncing in between, gets in between here, bounces in between, gets in between here, bounces in between. But you have to see it live when it's bouncing in between the lines, That's right? Bounces in between, falls out. Anyway, why did I take this one here? I took that one there because that that's the next uh, support, right, as far as a quadrant. So, you know, I waited for it to get up in there. It came up here. I should have sold here. That's what that white arrow. And I was there. I, I could have. Anyway, it came off. <clears throat> um, is this a good place to take? It could, could have taken it there, but I thought, well, I'm going to wait for my second. Because you don't see the tail there. But because uh, the line of the quadrant, the mid midline of that quadrant. But what I'm saying is you could have taken that there, but I was waiting for the second test, right? So it comes up here, comes down, and I hit it. That's the second test. So second test here, confirms here. Second test here, should have sold there. I had resistance. I had my quad wall here. And it was an obvious sell because you can always re-enter. Anyway, um, so I hit it here, comes up here. And it was getting close to the decision for the up channel or down channel. I sold there. Hits the target perfectly uh, that we produced for our members. Gets up and it's confirming into the up channel. I got really aggressive in there and bullish. And so I actually took the trade early. Normally I won't take it until after the decision is confirmed. But I took a trade early. And sure enough, right after I took the trade, boom. Uh, I took another one here because we were up over this intraday support and I thought, well, I'll just try it. Uh, I knew my probabilities were fairly low, but I had good range, right? I already, already had range on my first entry and that's why I was, you know, I trade like one tenths, right? Or one to three tenths. Um, so then, you know, it started uh, testing supports and I exited at the red arrow. Then it comes off. And I should have got the support. I should have got the short there. There was no reason for not getting it, but it's in an up channel, right? So I'm not going to typically trade the short side while it's in an up channel. Comes down, test support, and uh, why did I take the? Oh, I took the entry here because it hit support, and now it's up over a fib. And did I actually sit through that? Yeah, I sat through it because it was past the decision, right here. I actually sat through that downdraft. Gets back up here, and I sold. And the reason why I sold was I thought, you know, so now I'm now I'm double-minded. I'm thinking, well, what if it happens again, and what if it confirms down? So I just sold. So that was kind of a crappy trade in there. I should have sold right there. So really, that really deserves. That was not, that was not good execution. So I got lucky. I did have the decision on my side. So I should have sold there because you can always re-enter. Anyway, got lucky, uh, sold there, came up. Now it got over this midline, and that's important, resistance, right? You see how it reacted to the midline. Tested down here, boom, I hit it, and I sold there. Why did I sell there? It was resistance, I guess. Obviously shouldn't have. Uh, because it proved out, hit resistance, hit resist. That dotted uh, support is a really light support. So those, those horizontal lines that are dotted, I mean, that's the lightest it can be. Anyway, it bounced off it. 
and there's no reason for me not to take the trade right in here. I'm not sure why I didn't. Oh, I had you know another decision coming with those purple lines. Oh, and I had um, I had you know serious resistance here, the, the uh, broader range. So I wanted it to get up in here. Anyway, long story short, it uh, did its thing through here. It got to its decision point at EIA. Boom. I let it, uh, if you watch the video, I didn't take it on the first boom. I took it after it settled down It was and it was firming in. It was firming up. And um, so, you know, I scaled in really hard. Uh, sold here. Got a nice win. It doesn't look like it, but for the size I'm using, it was nice. Hit resistance here. Came off. Came back up. And I should have hit it right here. And we've already talked about that. So that's basically what's happened so far. So those, you know, a few days of trade, um, fantastic opportunity for trade. And I screamed it from the rooftops on Twitter that this was coming. And of course, um, you know, there's a lot of people that know better out there. And oh well. Um, and you'll find with this model over and over again, um, the media and stuff. Like I remember when it hit that big cluster, and I. I remember Bernard was trading it. Um, that resistance cluster, the main uh, method, uh, or the most highly probable method that Epic trades under, you can trade with Epic. Um, and that morning, like I put it right on my feet, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing on TV because I knew the cluster and the time cycle was right there. And I was just like, I can't believe this expert's on TV telling, literally telling people to scale into oil. And that day it just crashed. Um, so those kind of things, uh, you know, when you see that, that, that sells a person. Uh, so I'm not here, why well, I'm here to sell people. I'm, but I'm not here to sell you. I'm here to teach, uh, uh, to teach our traders how to use this properly. Going forward soon, like all these videos will be delayed. So the public, uh, just won't have the advantage of the edge that our traders have. Um, but, um. Anyway, that'll be coming here shortly in the next week or so. Uh, one other quick update is we allowed 50 yen. We're finding that about uh, between a tenth and half. So we get between 10 and 25 in the room at any given time. And I'm finding the workload I can handle. Uh, so we might uh, increase that and let another 25 or 50 in, in the next few weeks. We'll see how that goes. We have a number of different things happening between now and the fall. Uh, and the fall is kind of as our business is concerned, the next kind of phase. So we're completing all of our algorithms this summer, um, all of our modeling, uh, everything that we got to do that's kind of like cleaning the house and get everything published properly. And, and so you'll see all that over the next couple months. And then going into the fall, uh, we're into a totally different uh, uh, framework in terms of things. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot planned. Like, I'll just, you know, just simple little things like, um, you know, guest speakers on podcasts, running uh, podcasts, different uh, guests running, um, you know, different blogs and um, and our algorithms are, um, you know, will all be published at that point and then our trading rooms are going to go through a fairly significant uh, amount of uh, promo and then, um, you know, we're going to package things up uh, uh, McDonald's style, right? Um, with the little clean, flashy 20 second video together and those kind of things. So we're going to kind of get out of, uh, you know, startup phase is what I'm trying to say and get polished up. Um, but more than that, uh, our private trading group um, uh, fund is, uh, is, will have full flight. So there's lots happening between now and September. Um, so I think that that, as far as my perspective, tells you what I needed to tell you. So I'm just going to look in the room here and see if there's any questions at all for me. So I'm going to start at the most recent question. So Spiegel, looking at Epic's profit loss statement, trades made by Tex, I see sometimes they have trades that went for three plus wins, but wouldn't it be hitting some significant support or resistance and be sold before profit can get that big? So what we do is the techs are trained like you guys. The techs have never traded ever. The techs 
were given, what was different was they were given only one way to trade at a time. So they have the full knowledge that you have right now, but when they first started trading it, they were given uh, the most probable, then the second most probable, and this was given to them over time because they don't, you know, they're not traders. And the reason we're doing that is that we're hoping that over time we can have enough people that don't know how to trade um, learn the basics of, um, of the indicators to show this can actually be done by anybody. Um, so to understand their reasoning, um, that's something I can't, I can't help you with uh, because we don't talk to them. You don't talk to them and they don't talk back to us and they don't talk back to you uh, intentionally to see if somebody can take the information that we put out there and can actually trade it. Now, it's not very scientific because we only have three right now. I mean, ideally you'd want a thousand, right? Um, so you're seeing uh, results from three different techs at different levels of understanding over a period of time given different indicators um, with their own um, you know their own bias so three people is not you know is not going to give you a scientific result but it's better than having uh, people that are um, you know influenced by uh, other traders or by us and that kind of thing so you know we'll see how it goes in the future I know this area right now and not not one of the three has traded it which I found really interesting at support at the most recent like um, I thought that support was pretty obvious. I mean, I traded it, um, but not one of the three have taken a trade yet. So at least I don't think, no, they haven't. I haven't seen a trade. So, you know, it is what it is. That's uh, the nature of how we, uh, we just wanted to see, you know, could the average person that's never traded actually trade it. Uh, and um, yeah, so you're best just ignoring them. Uh, I mean, I, that's why I review my trades because, you know, I'm a trader and it, uh, it's easier for me to, well, I, number one, I can answer your questions. Uh, but number two, um, um, you know, we can, we can, you know, talk, talk or communicate uh, like a trader can. Yeah. So it's interesting. The idea eventually is to have as many of those, uh, you know, kind of blind study people as possible to get a fairly scientific result um, so that we can get a fairly general idea you know here's you know a, a very experienced trader trading it and here's a not very experienced trader trading it and you know here's the difference in their performance and so now that I'm recording my trades uh, you know we'll be able to take them side by side and then you guys you know you guys will have your own trades and uh, we'll be able to see you know here's how the members do um, like I asked one of our members last night on on Skype conference, like we'll be conferencing with all you guys soon. Um, and I asked them, you know, could you take the Epic model and could you trade it for a hundred percent return a year? And could you, you know, basically give me your word you could do that? And he said, without a doubt, there's no, no doubt. Um, you know, I know that I can, if I was full-time trading, I know, you know, I'd probably you know, that sounds crazy, but I think I'd be close to a thousand percent a year. I'd at least hit 300% a year because there's so many opportunities every day in and out, in and out, in and out. That, yeah. So, yeah, interesting. Um, what we did, we thought, you know, we'll try and see if we can get there. But yeah, I was stunned they didn't take the trade. And not one of the three, like all three of them had opportunities. I was watching close and I was like, not one of them, not one of them took it. Uh, which is curious to me, but you know, whatever it is, what it is, uh, Matt. Okay. So Matt's not asking any questions. Sorry guys. I just got to scroll up here really quick. See if there's any other questions. What's really cool is we're getting really close to uh, coding time because we're almost done building out the model. Like we're right there, like we're in discussions now and discussions for all kinds of cool stuff. So we're getting there one step at a time. Okay, you guys are going to have to do me a favor. If you 
you have any questions that I haven't addressed, put them back in there for me. I think you guys are getting the hang of it. Well, obviously they are with your trading. In the future, will you have a day where you do trade in and out all day with oil? I know you mentioned that you will with volatility. And, uh, well, um, yeah, I mean, I missed a few in here. Um, but, you know, I don't. I wouldn't trade much heavier than that. Like, uh, like I just went through, like, the most recent trading, right? So I missed a trade there today. I missed a trade there. Uh, you know, there is a trade presenting itself here, maybe. I'd have to think through that one. And then, you know, there's a few other white arrows, but I don't know how much more I would trade than that, Henry. Um, I guess you could get one in here, you know, out there. Um, maybe. Um, you can go super uh, high frequency, but I don't think benefits anybody. Um, I mean, I could. I guess there, you know you could have got one here, but resistance is so close. It depends on what you're trying to get from a trade, too. Um, so the answer is probably not, Henry. Like I'll probably continue similar to this. Um, I have to balance the trades with you know the reality of my life too, right? So um, I'm not a full-time trader right now. I'm a full-time uh, teacher. Uh, and, um, you know, we're running a service, so I can only trade so much, too. So if I sit down and start high free, yeah, I'm struggling with the question because I might, you know. But I would look to what you see there and say to yourself, you know, that's pretty much what I can expect from Kurt. But there are some things coming. I guess that's a better way to answer the question. There are some things coming where there are going to be traders uh, doing much, much higher frequency than I do. Um, now, our fund, I don't know if I'm going to be able to share those or not. I can't see why not. I can't see why we wouldn't be able to share those trades. I'm thinking of that out loud right now. Like, I haven't thought through it. But, but um, yeah, that'll be interesting because that'll be fairly high frequency too. So I bet you we're going to be able to share their trades. So the traders uh, for our, um, our private fund trading, so that would really then, you know, that gets you really four different types of trades. You get the traders for our fund. You get the technicians that have never traded before. Uh, you get my trades. And then you guys sharing your trades. Um, so, and the more you guys share your trades, I think the better. And the more you guys talk about it, I think the better too. And that also gives me insight so I can help you guys, right? I can read through your chat log and go, okay, you know. And then when I reach out to you guys, because I'll be doing that, I started last night or the night before reaching out to members and having conversations about your trade. Um, because, of course, it's to my benefit. And that's part of the problem, right? Like with our technicians, I'm not going to give them, I'm not going to, you know, push them up over the wall if they're struggling. Uh, they're given the instruction that anybody out in the world would get through the information that's available. Um, but they're not getting any coaching. They're just getting the, the raw data information, and that was really the purpose, right? Uh, but you guys, uh, we don't have a choice. Uh, you have to be successful, uh, or we look like idiots, right? Uh, the technicians, if if they don't, if they if they aren't successful, I don't care. You know, if somebody look, looks at it and says, "Oh, look at that," you know, they're they're losing. I'd be like, "So what?" You, like you don't, you know, you don't understand what they're doing. Uh, and if you if you can't stop long enough, and that's part of the conversations that are happening right now, like the packaging that's happening for our whole enterprise for the fall is you know the McDonald's package, right? It's the you know the McDonald's society that we're in. Um, you know Kurt's uh, videos, you know ramble on videos, and um, you know all the technical information and you know all the the raw data. You know how much does that really do do to reach out to you know a McDonald's drive-through generation that needs sound bites that are 22 seconds or less. Um, it really doesn't do a lot for that. But, you know, I think I'm doing people a disservice by, you know, um, had I just had I just uh, done that in the beginning 
without all this raw data. See, with all this raw data, people can dig into it and they can, they can you know, that really want to try. Um, dig into what you guys say in chat logs, dig into what I say on, you know, the raw data video, dig into, you know, what the technicians are doing as trades, what I'm doing as trades, what you guys are doing as trades. And uh, yeah, our, and then our trading group starts. I mean, there'll be so much raw data there by the time September 1st comes. Um, that in my mind, you know, that, that drive through, uh, you know, a few drive through 22 second polished ads and, you know, happy people talking about how well they trade. Uh, to me, it's kind of like, you know, this is BS, but, um, you know, eventually you got to put some paint and polish on the car and present it to the public in a real fashion. But um, to me, this is this is the real deal. So, yeah, so that's my broad perspective on a, on a pointed question. I apologize for going way off, but I think it kind of gives you the spirit of what we're up to here. And the whole idea was to, for it to be really organic. The whole idea was for all of it to eventually... Uh, be totally democratized, right? Like this model, this epic model, um, you know, to bring it down from uh, where it's used uh, to the everyday public. It's funny because you put it right in front of the public. They don't, even, you know, they don't even know what they're looking at. Um, you put it in front of, um, like I talked to a desk trader last night. You put it in front of, uh, you know, uh, people that work in, in uh, you know, professional trading environments. They don't even know what they're looking at. Because the algorithmic modelers that are banking, uh, the kind of bank that they're doing here, you know, it isn't traded at a city uh, trading desk. Uh, this is this is private enterprise uh, making massive gains, um, you know, and it's not you know Bank of America's uh, you know everyday traders. So that's a broad answer, I understand, but that I wanted to make sure the spirit is dealt with there. Uh, so you guys are going to be a lot of those things. So when you ask questions, <clears throat> what's going to happen is you guys are going to be, you know, encouraged to take, and I'll just say this to conclude, you guys are going to be encouraged, and ladies, we have some lady members in our oil room, by the way, um, to take uh, these things up, you know. Um, so we're, we're running a series of conference calls with people right now. And we'll continue to through our development uh, to encourage people that are, you know, members or involved in our enterprise in some way uh, to become even more involved. You know, like some of them as employees, uh, some of them as entrepreneurial, you know, sub offshoots, uh, some, you know, just because they enjoy it. They're, you know, retired or semi-retired and they just want to you know, do something to give back to their trading community. Um, so all of those different things. And, you know, where that's all going to go, that's going to be the members. Like right now it's, it's you know, it's us driving that. But, you know, the sooner that gets really organic and, um, and takes on a life of its own, that's the vision for it. The vision for it was that. Because I could have taken it right from day one and just traded it myself or started a fund, right? And, and you know, Sartash told me, you know, the retail public gang, you know, they're not going to adopt it. Um, you know, we're just going to end up trading this in our own fund. Um, and we have lots of pull. Like, um, you know, with the retail public, we have to explain it. We have to teach. We have to, you know, convince, try and sell, do all those kind of things. Uh, on the commercial side, um, you know, the private funds, um, they're after us. You know, and I'm talking literally, you know, where they pull up to me and try and get my time. Uh, like I snapped a little picture of a fellow that stopped for lunch the other day. Um, you know, he literally tracked me for weeks and, um, you know, <laughs> uh, pulled up and said, hey, you know, I want to buy you lunch. And um, so that happens all the time. And that's what's happening in our environment right now because they know, they know how it works. It works, right? It, if you understand trading and you understand money, uh, it should, it really, like if you stop, more than two minutes and you work with the model and look look at it and see how it trades uh, you, you know show me how it doesn't work so anyway I think I think I've kind of given you the spirit of it and I didn't want to sound like I was selling it too hard there but I'm just trying to tell you where it's at there guys so as far as the actual trading is concerned, 222, oil's closing right away. You've got those time cycles. Those are the most important between now and then. Um, 
I think you know where your trades are at. And then after those time cycles, so going into next week, next week will be interesting. I got to look at the at the uh, schedule, but um, yeah, this will be because you've got that decision right here, you know, to continue up the channel or down. Those purple arrows aren't in here, but there would be one here going up and one going down. Okay, super cool. I don't think there's any more questions, so I'm going to let you guys uh, do your thing. I'm um, going to have a light afternoon going forward. Uh, I'm going to reset. So what time was this last reset? So I'm going to, it has to be reset every 10 hours. Um, I'll figure it out. I'll send out a message on, on the reset. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks, guys. Talk to you later.